Well, hello, Hills Church. It is good to be back with you. Um, after an introduction like that, man, I feel amazing. Uh, my wife wouldn't even say all those nice things about me. You know, she'd say, okay, pastor, decent husband, you know, marginally above average father. That'd probably be what she would say. But it is good to be back with you. I was here last summer. Um, and so evidently what I said last summer wasn't horrific. They let me come back. Uh, if things go well today, I will be back July 7th, but that is to be determined <laughs> based on how we do today. Uh, let me introduce you to my family. They're not able to be with me today, but here is a photo. Uh, my wife and I just celebrated 27 years of marriage. Yeah, we got married. We were like 12 years old. It was pretty amazing. Um, actually, I was uh, 23. She was 19. Don't judge. You get married young when you're trying to follow Jesus. That's all I'm saying, all right? Uh, I have three kids. My daughter, uh, actually, I told you this last time. I still have uh, two amazing kids and another one. Um, I'll let you decide. Uh, my daughter on the right goes to University of Kansas, and uh, then my boys just finished freshman year and sophomore year of high school. So uh, good to be with you. Now, today I want to talk about something that athletes would call being in the zone. This is when uh, there is a supreme state of focus that allows an athlete to achieve peak performance, right? All of a sudden, the swing feels really good. The basket looks twice as big as it normally does when they're shooting. The baseball slows down. They can see the laces. They're in the zone. Artists would call it when inspiration strikes, it's when all of a sudden the song just starts to write itself. The lyrics are just flowing. The chords are happening. The blank canvas begins to show the artist what should be painted. The story in the mind of the writer just comes to life. Engineers would call it a moment of clarity or illumination, where all of a sudden the problem they've been trying to solve becomes clear. All of a sudden, the math or the science just makes sense and shows them the way. No matter your job or no matter your field, I think we all understand those moments where breakthrough happens, where all of a sudden, it's just easier. The work flows easier. The obstacles are overcome. And did you know in the Christian life, we have this too? Although it's way bigger and better than being in the zone or having inspiration strike, or having a moment of clarity. Scripture calls it walking in the Spirit. And every Jesus follower is invited to walk in the Spirit. But it's something we have to participate in. Here's an anchor scripture for today that talks about walking in the Spirit. And I'm going to explain what that means and teach us how to actually do it today. Galatians 5.25, it says this. Go ahead and put that up on the screen if you guys would. And uh, when the word is bolded, I want you to say it out loud for me today. It says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in with the Spirit. That's the NIV, tra NIV translation. Let's look at the same passage of Scripture in the what's called the voice translation. It says this. Now, since we have chosen to walk with the Spirit, let's keep each in perfect sync with God's spirit. You see, you and I are invited to keep in perfect sync with God's spirit. That means every day in every way of our life, where we live, where we work, where we play, we are invited to keep in step with what God is doing in our life, through our life, around us. We are invited to walk with God. And did you know the most common metaphor in all of scripture for a life described as connected with God? Do you know that it's walk? More than 800 times in the Bible, a life connected to God is referred to as a walk, a step, a path. Think about some of the most well-known scriptures in the Bible. If you're a Bible person, you might know some of these. Psalm 119, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my, anyone? Path. Micah 6, 8 says we are called to act justly and to love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. 
In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. Psalm 23, even though I run through the valley of the shadow of death, is that what it says? No, even though I walk. The most common metaphor over and over and over again for a life connected with God is to walk. And I love that because I'm not a runner. I know you look at me today and you're like, man, that guy must run marathons. I do not. Never have. In fact, I learned something when I even got the most fit I've ever been in my life as an adult. I played football all the way through college. Shocker, I was a lineman, <laughs> which meant you could be big. Um, in fact, they wanted you as big as possible. Uh, but a couple guys in our church that were in my small group talked me into doing some triathlons. So this is several years ago. And they were like, dude, let's do some triathlons. San Diego's like the mecca of triathlons. And that's where you swim, you bike, you run. And um, here's what I learned. I learned that even at my skinniest, I would call myself big skinny. <laughs> because I got in the best shape of my life. In my a whole adult life, I got down to the lowest weight I had ever been. Because I'm like, if I'm going to swim, I don't want to drown. If I'm going to bike, I don't want to fall over. And if I'm going to run, I just don't want to die. So let me get in really good shape. And so I signed up for my first race. And you have to put in your age, your height, and your weight. And after I submitted my registration for my first triathlon, again, I'm like the skinniest I'd ever been. I get back, congratulations, you qualify for a special division in the race. <laughs> Wait for it. It's called the Clydesdale division. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Do you know what Clydesdales are? They're like those big giant horses. And I just thought to myself, I was like some little skinny dude made that up. And if I have to be a Clydesdale, then any guy in the race under a buck 50 is a show pony. That's what I, oh, look at the show pony go by. Right, but there's no show pony division, just, you know, Clydesdale division. And, and I realized like for me, when I was doing races, and I did several over the course of like three, four years. Um, believe it or not, I was halfway decent at the swim. I was on swim team as a little kid so I could you know, get myself through the water. I, they, they put a tracker on you, tell you how you finish. I would usually finish in the top 30% you know, of the swim. Then on the bike, a little slower, but I was top 50, 60%. And then on the run, every race is where the Clydesdale came out. In fact, my last race, I was you know, on the run, they write your age on your arm and your calf. And I, they want to identify, you know, when did you start? I think it's also to shame you if you're slow. Um, because you start in age groups where like, you know, the younger you are, the earlier you start. And so everybody in their 20s starts, then they wait 10 minutes, and then they let everybody in their 30s start, then they wait 10, 15 minutes, 40s. I was in my late 30s at this time. And so I'm on the run and people start passing me with 40s on their calf. No big deal. I didn't feel that bad about myself. Then people started passing me with 50s. Kind of a deal. Then a guy went flying by me and it said 68 on his calf. That was my last race. Okay. <laughs> I, I just decided to quit at that point. Now, why? Because I like walking. And that's why I love that the most common metaphor in all of scripture is to walk. Here's why. Because I read that and I go, I can do that. I can do it. What is a walk? Left, right, left, right, day after day, simple. Everyone is invited to keep up. Everybody is invited to participate. And this is the picture that we have in scripture in a life with God. That we're not trying to like keep up with God. We're just trying to go at a walking pace with him that he wants to journey with us through our day-to-day -day regular experience. Students at your schools, on summer break, on your jobs, in your neighborhood, when you go to the gym and run, whatever it is you do, you are invited to do that with the Lord. That's what it means to walk in the spirit. But the biggest obstacle to walking in the spirit, you know what it is? The Bible calls it our flesh. That's our own sinful desires. And so every day we have this choice. We have this 
sometimes it feels like a battle. Am I gonna walk in the spirit or am I gonna walk in the flesh? Walking in the spirit is living from God's strength. Walking in the flesh is living from our strength. Walking in the spirit is listening to the voice of God and letting him lead and direct our life. Walking in the flesh is putting our voice and our opinion and our wants ahead of God's voice. Walking in the flesh is living in the ways of the world. You see, walking in the spirit is humility. Walking in the flesh is pride. Walking in the spirit is being a San Diego Padres fan. (laughs) Walking in the flesh would be being a San Francisco Giants or even worse, a Dodger fan. (laughs) Right? Now, what does it look like? Some of you are like, yep, right there. Did not get invited back now. (laughs) It's been fun. All right. uh, So what does it look like to walk in the spirit? How do we keep in step with the spirit? What does an empowered life every day in every way look like? Well, we need to look no farther than Jesus, right? Jesus is our model. Jesus is our example. He is God in the bod. He became one of us to show us what love looks like to show us how to live this life connected with God. And so we need to look no farther than to say, how did Jesus do it? Because he was fully God and he was fully man. And Jesus is the perfect example of someone who walked in step with God. And so how is it you and I can do it? Well, let's look at what it says in Luke 5, 16. From this little scripture, it teaches us one of the ways, the core ways that Jesus walked in the spirit. Here's what it says. It says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and what did he do there? Everybody say it out loud. He prayed. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. This was a regular routine in Jesus' life. You see, Jesus knew he needed to do certain things regularly to be able to walk in the spirit that he couldn't just stay away from God. He had to regularly be connected with God so he could keep in perfect sync and step with God's spirit. So here's what I wanna do real quick for the rest of our time. I wanna get real practical and give you four ways to pray like Jesus so you can keep in step with the spirit this week, starting today, continuing tomorrow. How can you keep in step with the spirit? It's a little acrostic with the word pray. The P stands for pause. The first thing we need to do is we just have to pause. Hurry is the great enemy of our spiritual life. To live and walk in the ways of Jesus, we have to slow down. Are there any NASCAR fans in here? All right, a couple. First of all, I wanna let you know Jesus can deliver you from that. That's possible. Um, And secondly, it's not really a sport, okay? Um, You know, Turn left, go straight, turn left, go straight, not a sport. But anyway, in NASCAR, the goal is to win the race. But in NASCAR, they know you can't just go pedal to the metal and expect to win the race. One of the most strategic parts of car racing, of NASCAR, is this thing called the pit what? Stop. Like you have to pause. You have, to, they have, you have to get off the racetrack so the car can be renewed, it can be refueled. And it's a great picture in our life and in walking with the spirit. This is what Jesus did. Jesus paused. When you read the life of Christ, he regularly got away from the crowds. Why? So he could refuel, so he could recharge. And so many times, I think the reason we struggle is we never slow down. Look at Psalm 46.10. It says this, be in a hurry and know that I am God. Is that what it says? No. What does it say? Be what? Be still and know that I am God. I think many times we struggle to know God because we never slow down. We never pause. We don't rest. We just keep filling our lives and our schedules with more and more activity and business, right? Right? And the access to information and noise doesn't help. Right? I know in my own life, I regularly go on breaks from my phone. Because if not, it's just noise. Right? I'm I'm, I always want to be looking at something. I want to have music on. I want to be. And and we need some times to be able to pause. Because if we just keep filling our lives and filling our schedules with more and more activity, the problem is this. 
as my pace of life increases, you know what almost always happens? My peace in life decreases. Have you ever noticed that? That as I just push it to the edge and push it to the limits, my peace de- decreases. And what, in, what ends up happening is if we push our pace for too long, too fast, we almost always end up burning out or blowing up. Let me give you an example of this using this balloon. All right. Uh, I want you to think about the balloon. This is your life. And the air that is going to fill this balloon is all the activities in your life. Now think about when kids are really little and we start them out going to preschool or kindergarten, right? They they have to do some activities. They go to preschool and kindergarten and they have a little, you know, time where they start learning the ABCs. So they sit down and they actually have to learn for a little bit. So there's a little activity with the ABCs, right? Then maybe there's a little, let's learn the letters. Then they maybe sing a song. But then, here's what's amazing about preschool and kindergarten. We realize with little kids, they need to work hard, but they also need to play hard and rest hard. And so in preschool or kindergarten, they take a nap after a little bit of learning. That's the sound of a nap, okay? (laughs) And so there is this fill and then this release. Wouldn't you love that if your boss said, new plan, right? Right? After three hours of intense work, we take a 25-minute nap, right? Or, hey, after you finish this project, we all get a lay down, you know? <laughs> I'm going to give you an extra two days off when this, like, we would all love that. But for some reason, we understand this with kids, right? They go to school, they go to math class, they go to English, right? Maybe they have a foreign language. And then even in elementary school, they get recess. They get a break, But for some reason with adults, we just fill and fill and fill our lives with more and more and more. And then we wonder why we blow up or we burn out, right? What happens is we go to work on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, short day, right? (laughs) Then each of those nights, what do we do? We got to run the kids to karate, sports practice. You know, we got to help them with homework. Ooh, feel the tension. Then the weekend comes. We think we're going to get a break. Oh, no. Now they have a karate tournament. (laughs) Right? Then we got to take them on a travel soccer game. (laughs) Then Sunday comes. We got to get to church. (laughs) Are you feeling the tension right now? Because I am. And here's the problem. What inevitably happens in our life, we keep filling the schedule week after week, day after day, month after month, and eventually there's going to be a blow up. I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> or there's going to be a really bad burnout. There you go. Little gift for the guitar player back there. Uh, and here's what, we end up, here's what ends up happening, right? Like we release in unhealthy ways. We get caught up in the throes of an addiction. We run away from our marriage. We can't handle our job anymore. We, can't, we drop out of school. You see, often in our attempts to get the most out of life, the most out of our career, the best opportunities for our kids, we can actually end up losing control of our life. Jesus said something about this in Luke chapter 15. He said, what good is it if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? What good is it if we fill our schedule week after week, month after month, year after year, but we lose our faith or our kids have none, right? What good is it if they're on the best travel sports team, but they have no time for God? And I'm talking to somebody who has kids on travel sports teams, right? Like, so it's not that those things are bad. It's just that we got to make sure we're not pushing us or our kids to the limits, to the edges. Jesus, to walk in the spirit, had regular pauses, and we must too. So if we're gonna walk in the spirit, the P for pray stands for pause. The R is this, we need to learn regular rhythms. Walking in the spirit and keeping in step with the spirit happens when we live in a regular rhythm of work and rest. You know what the Bible calls that in the Old Testament? A Sabbath day. I mean, just think about that for a moment. When God has given out the top 10 list to the nation of Israel, he's like, there's 10 things I either don't want you to do or do. Top 10. When he's saying things like, don't murder, 
Don't kill, don't steal, don't listen to Taylor Swift music because it's really all the same breakup song, right? Um, Okay, maybe that one's not in there, but the same God that had all these big rules, he goes, take a day off. Think about that. Our creator knew that we were created to live in this rhythm of work and rest. Think about this question. What makes a great song? I mean, besides, you know, the person singing it, having an amazing voice and all that. You want to know what makes great music? That's probably a better question. Rhythm, right? Music is purposeful starts and stops of sounds, right? We call those notes. And if you're looking at a sheet of music, it tells you how long to start and stop that note. If there's no pauses or rhythm in music, you know what you get? A middle school band concert. That's what you get. You're like, oh, this sounds terrible. You ever been to one of those? I've suffered through many with my kids, right? Where it's like, dear Lord, nobody's playing the right thing at the right time. Like, it's just like chaos, right? If you want good music, there's silence and sounds to rhythm. I'm gonna prove this to you, all right? Everybody, I want you to get your instruments out. We're gonna use our hands, Okay, and we're gonna use our thighs, okay? And uh, so here's what I want you to do. First, I wanna show you that without everyone playing in the same rhythm, it sounds like chaos. I'm gonna count to three and say go. When I say go, you just play whatever beat you want, right? What are you feeling right now, right? And I just want you, like, whatever beat you feel, you do you, okay? (laughs) On the count of three, everybody in the room, ready? One, two, three, go. Okay, stop. Middle school band concert, am I right? No, like, are they playing a song? Because I can't tell, right? Okay, now we're all gonna play the same beat with pause, silence, and sound. And let's start it together, okay? We're gonna go like this. We're gonna go two down here, one here. Everybody? Buddy, you're a boy making big noise, playing in the street, gonna be a big man someday. Mud on your face, big disgrace, kicking that can all over the place. Sing it. We will rock you. One more time. We will, we will rock you. Okay, we'll stop right there. You might not know scripture in this church, but you know Queen, okay? (laughs) Not sure what that says about us, but anyway. Here's the point. Rhythm is sound and silence. Sound and silence and purposeful pattern is what makes great music. And a once a week Sabbath, a day of rest, is the silence to our six days of sound. And if our life is gonna create beautiful music in our homes, in our marriages, as parents, as grandparents, we have to learn to live in that rhythm of work and rest. A Sabbath brings structure and repeated pattern that creates this healthy foundation. It's what you see Jesus lived from. It's why Jesus was not overwhelmed, right? I mean, he's carrying the fate of the world. The time we see Jesus overwhelmed is when he's praying before he knows he's gonna die at the cross. But Jesus wasn't overwhelmed, why? Because he's keeping in step with the spirit, right? He's living this regular rhythm. Look at what it says in Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. It says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Now, this passage is talking about like New Testament, New Covenant, different than Old Testament, Old Covenant, And the rest this is talking about is we don't have to strive to gain God's approval, to get his forgiveness. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works. Isn't that good news? Like we're not trying to earn anything from God by doing this, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. Meaning there should be this easiness to walking with Jesus. Not that it's always easy, because it's not, right? I was talking to somebody in the cafe before service started and uh, Pastor Jonathan referenced, I've been at the church I've served at for 21 years. And here's what I told him. I was like, it's been mostly fun, (laughs) right? And that's true, mostly fun. 
Because is everything in your life or your work or in your faith always easy or always? No, it's not, right? But there should be an easiness to walking with God. We're not striving to earn his love, earn his favor, earn his acceptance. We already have it. So what do we have to do? We pause, we need rhythm. And then here's the next one. The A is ask. If we're gonna walk in God's spirit, we have to ask where his spirit is actually leading. I mean, how often in our lives do we make plans? Do we strategize? Do we make decisions without ever taking the time to ask, God, where is your spirit leading in this situation? Where are you leading in my career on this job? Where are you leading me in this choice of what college to go to? Where are you leading us as a family? Look what it says in Ephesians 6.18. The apostle Paul says to the church, he says, pray in the spirit some of the times with some kinds of prayers, asking for just a few things you need. Is that what it says? No, the way I read it is just how most of us live, including myself, right? We're like, oh, this isn't, you know, I don't need to go to God for this. No, look what it says. Pray in the spirit at what times? All. All. With what kinds of prayers? All kinds of prayers. Asking for, say it out loud, everything that you need. In other words, God wants us to bring all of our lives to him. The way we walk in the spirit is by saying, Lord, in this situation, on this day, how are you leading me? How are you guiding me? We make ourselves aware that God is with us and he is walking with us as we go into the gym, as we go to the supermarket, as we go to our job, as we go to school, as we hang out with friends, that God is there. He is with us. It is this daily walk. So we walk in the spirit by pausing, by having rhythms, by asking God, where is he leading? How is he working in our church, in our lives, in our family? God, help us see it and help us keep in step with it. And then here's the last one, the why. The why of pray is to yield. We yield. In other words, when we get to the end, we simply say, God, not just where are you leading, but now I will follow. Yield means to let someone go first. Think about it in the context of driving. What does yield mean in driving? It means to give way. Now, no one does this in California, right? Like, no one knows what this means. To give way means, oh no, you go ahead, right? I'm gonna let you in front. And so yielding is how we walk in God's spirit. No, 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 God, I'm gonna let you in front. You go first. Another helpful picture of yielding is to think military rankings. How many of you ever served in our military in any branch? All right, awesome. Thank you for your service. If you served in our military, if you served in our military, you understand what this word yield means. In fact, submission is a synonym for yield and submission is a military word that means to rank under. And if you were in the military and you ranked under someone, what did you do? You yielded to the person that had rank over you, right? In other words, they gave the commands and you followed. That didn't mean that you couldn't voice your opinion. If you had a great supervisor or if you had a great commander or someone to lead, they're gonna want to know opinions. But at the end of the day in military, you understand the idea of following someone else's lead, following someone else's word. And it's a great picture of this life of walking in the spirit that we say, God, at the end of prayer, guess what? I'm done. What are you saying? And then here's the key. Even before you know what he's saying, you make a decision. The answer is already yes, no matter what he says. Lord, whatever you say, the answer is already yes. That's what it means to yield. This is how we walk in the spirit. I wanna tell you one last story and then I'm gonna pray for us and then we'll have our communion moment and be done. One of my favorite books that talks about living this kind of way uh, is a book called The Unhurried Life. Here's what it looks like. Uh, The author, Alan Fadley, and after I read the book, found out he lived in Southern California. He and I become friends. I've had him come teach our staff. 
But the author uh, in this book, he talks about how do we as Jesus people, in other words, walk in the spirit, live an unhurried life. When you read about Jesus, isn't it incredible? Jesus was never in a hurry. <laughs> Oftentimes he, it bothered people. He'd be like, no, nah, we'll just wait right here. Like they'd be like, well, no, Jesus, all these people. He's like, no, it's good, right? Uh, but in this book, um, Alan, the author, tells this amazing story about going to China and getting to meet one of the, uh, honestly, great Chinese Christian leaders of a generation by the name of Wang Ming Dao. And when he met him, Wang was in his 80s and he led a house church movement in communist China at a time where your life was threatened to just be a Christian, let alone lead other people to Christ. And this man is viewed in China as a giant of the Christian faith. And because of his faith, he actually spent more than 25 years in prison because of simply preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And he's out of prison. He's an old man at this time. He's in his 80s. And Alan, who wrote the book, tells a story in his book about getting to meet this giant of the faith. And he asks him this question. He says, Pastor Wang, how is it that you kept your faith? How did you stay faithful to God during all those years in prison? And then Pastor Wang actually turned the question back on Alan, the author, and he said, well, young man, how do you walk with God every day? And kind of flustered by getting the question turned back on him, he says, well, uh, I, I, I read my Bible, I pray, I go to church, and he lists off all of these kind of like activities and then he was quickly interrupted by Pastor Wang, who mischievously said to him, wrong answer. <laughs> and then he said this, to walk with God, you must go at a walking pace. Doesn't that sound like something an old Chinese pastor would say, <laughs> right? That's like a Yoda moment where you're like, whoa. Like, that's amazing to walk with God you must simply go at a walking place. And I think so often we're just sprinting from thing to thing to thing, and then we wonder why we never feel God. And so here's my invitation to you today. Will you walk in the Spirit today? Will you walk in the Spirit Monday? Will you walk in the Spirit Tuesday? Will you walk in the Spirit all of this week? And how are you gonna do that? Can you just find a moment each day to pause? to maybe turn the noise off. Is it in your car right before you, you know, head out or before you walk in? Is it on your lunch break? Like, like when is a moment you can just pause? And can you decide as we're heading into now this summer season to say, you know what, is there a better rhythm that we need to live as a family, me as an individual? You know, am I, am I getting that Sabbath rest so I'm not burned out or about to blow up? Like, can I, can I find that? Ask yourself, like, man, Lord, where are you leading? Ask him. Some of you, you're facing big decisions right now. You're facing decisions in your career. Your kids are facing decisions with school. Like, I don't know what's going on in your life, but God does. Ask him, God, where are you leading? And then why choose to yield? Say, Jesus, wherever you're going, I am gonna follow. That's how we walk in the spirit. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to take a moment and I want you to think about which of those four, P-R-A-Y, pause, rhythms, ask, yield. Which one do you need to focus on this week? Let's just take a moment of silent prayer. I want you to think about what is your step? How has the Holy Spirit spoken to you as a result of this service today? Let, let us not come in here and sing a few songs and hear a message and then walk out the same. Let's make some spiritual decisions, right? Let's not just be hearers of the word, let's be doers. How are you gonna put it into action? What's one thing that you would say, Lord, with your help right now, just in your own heart, in your own way, maybe you wanna say it softly out loud, God, with your help, help me pause this week. Help me create a better rhythm for our family this summer. Lord, help me ask you about that decision. Some of you, maybe it's just you need to yield. You've been running your race on your terms. And today God is coming to you and he's saying, will you let me lead? Will you let my grace cover you? Will you stop charging hard out in front and get behind 
and follow. Real quick, just before I lead us in a closing prayer, and then we have our communion moment, just with every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today and you would say, you know what? The biggest thing I need to do is just yield. Maybe you're here today and you're not walking with God at all. In fact, you would say you feel like you're a million miles away from him. But today you say, you know what, God, I wanna let you lead. I, I yield to you. I say yes to Jesus and what he did on the cross for me. And I wanna begin to follow him. If that's you, just raise your hand up all over the room and I just wanna include you in this last prayer. Awesome, awesome. Leave it up for a second. God sees that. He comes to you with his grace and his mercy and his love. And as you yield to him, his new life, his forgiveness, his grace, his goodness comes to you. Let me pray for us. Lord, we open our hearts to you and your good work. I pray for all those that just lifted a hand that just said they want to yield to you. They, they want to get behind you. They want to follow you. God, I pray they'd experience your love and your mercy and your grace in very real tangible ways. And Lord, for all of us this week, would you help us to walk in your spirit, not through our own strength, but in yours, keeping in perfect step, in perfect sync. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.